Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice to start a bachelor's degree since tuition is one-third the cost of four-year schools. More at tncc.edu. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We're coming to you live from the Fort Monroe Visitor Center here in Hampton, Virginia, in front of a fantastic live studio audience. Up next on Another View, a new look at a champion of freedom, Harriet Tubman. We'll explore the history of her nursing career here at Fort Monroe, caring for black soldiers as well as enslaved people held as contraband during the Civil War. We bring you this show in advance of the upcoming PBS documentary, Harriet Tubman, Visions of Freedom. It's a fascinating history that you don't want to miss. Stay tuned. Another View will be right back after this national, regional, and local news from NPR and WHRO News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We are so excited to be broadcasting live from the Fort Monroe Visitor Center here in Hampton, Virginia. Hello, live audience. How y'all doing? <laughs> We've got a great show for you today, but before we get started, I do want to mention that I had the awesome privilege of serving as the keynote speaker for the Gloucester NAACP uh, Freedom Fund Dinner last Saturday evening, and we had a marvelous time, so thank you to everyone who was in attendance. And they did ask me to share this information with uh, with you, audience. The Gloucester High School W.E.B. Du Bois Honor Society and the Education Committee of the Gloucester branch of the NAACP. ACP. They're hosting a college fair on October the 13th at Gloucester High School. That's at 6680 Short Lane in Gloucester. It's from 5 to 7 p.m. There are over 30 colleges and technical schools in attendance, and you can come learn about various programs that the colleges have to offer, as well as how to pay for that college education. So come on out. If you have questions, you can contact the NAACP at Gloucester NAACP at gmail.com. So thanks very much for that. So today we bring you an Another View history lesson about Harriet Tubman, a fresh look at this conductor of the Underground Railroad, Civil War scout, nurse, spy, and one of the greatest freedom fighters this country has ever known. I'm joined by our favorite internationally renowned uh, historian, Dr. Cassandra Newby alexander Hey, Cassandra. Thank you. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Mr. Joseph Rogers, he's manager of partnerships and community engagement with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. How you doing, Joseph? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being with us. And Ms. Deanna Mitchell, she's superintendent of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park, which is located in my home state of <laughs> Church Creek, Maryland. <laughs> how are you, Diana? I'm fine, Barbara. How are you? I'm great. Thanks okay. so much Thank for you. joining us. So let me start the conversation with you because we know this great woman that we're going to be talking about in this hour as Harriet Tubman, but she wasn't born Harriet Tubman. That's correct. She was born Araminta Ross, and um, her family and her loved ones, they called her Minty for short. So she changed her name to Harriet once she um, emancipated herself. Mm -hmm. And the reason she chose the name Harriet is because that was the name of her mother. And to honor her mother, she wanted to carry her mother's name, Harriet. Mm -hmm. And Cassandra, if I'm not mistaken, did I hear you say that one of your relatives was connected with the Rosses? Yes. My, um, one of my maternal aunts married a Harold Ross uh, mm -hmm. from Boston. 
and their family was descended from the Ross family. Of course, you know, Harriet Tubman did not have any children, but she took care of her sister, her brothers, her, the nieces and nephews, and et cetera, and she mm-hmm. even adopted some children. And so they were part of that extended family. Wow. So, Deanna, tell us a little bit about her growing up. What was life like where she grew up in Maryland? Well, Harriet experienced a very difficult childhood. And the family um, where she was born, she was born on one plantation and um, was separated. She and her mother and her sisters were separated from the rest of the family and moved to another plantation. Mm -hmm. So um, as a very, very young child. So that had to be awfully traumatic to her. Um, But as a little girl... um, she had to take on duties and responsibilities that we as adults do. Such as? Such as um, if she was loaned out to uh, another slave owner, which is mm-hmm. what they often did, um, she would have to do exactly what she was told by that slave owner or else. Case in point, um, one of the slave owners, um, the woman had a little baby, a knee baby, Little baby. Mm-hmm. So Harriet's five, six, year, six years old herself. She's a baby. Six years old. Yes. And she was to care for that baby. And she was given strict orders that you have to keep the baby quiet. If you do not keep the baby quiet, you will be dealt with. So, you know, a little baby, you don't know why they're crying. They're hungry. They need a diaper change. And, and so every time the baby cried, Harriet suffered. Um, at the hands of a whip. She Mm -hmm. was whipped repeatedly, mostly around the neck. Mm -hmm. And um, in our historic site, we have a bust of Harriet Tubman. And one of the things we wanted to make sure was um, we wanted to make um, that reality for visitors to understand. So you will see the markings on the bust um, around her neck. Mm -hmm. If she, if she um, didn't have the, table settings correct or if there was dust on the table settings she suffered at the hands of a whip and she was five or six years old at this point at this point yeah so her childhood was just traumatic on her the one thing that she did find solace in as a slave was um she felt like maybe i do better working outside outdoors than domestic help because i'm this is just not, this is not where I mm-hmm. need to be. So she would rather be in the field That's it. picking cotton or, or, or gathering vegetables right. or whatever. Yeah, yes, than, yes. Than to be inside. Cassandra, she um, was not an only child, right? No, she was one of 11 children. And, you know, her parents, um, uh, Harriet and Benjamin Ross, I believe, they... They were very close. They were unusual in that um, she grew up around her parents and her siblings, uh, which was very unusual for most enslaved people. Uh, By the time you are three, four, five years old, either one or both of your parents have been sold away from you or you've been sold away from them. Um, and, And child, this kind of child abuse was not unusual. Um, You know, America has a lot of amnesia about slavery and especially about the way that we treated children. Um, In New Orleans, one of the big markets was the sex trafficking market there. And there were houses of prostitution that specialized in child prostitution. But it wasn't illegal if it was an enslaved child because they were Mm. not regarded as human. human. Yeah. And and they were very, very popular. In fact, if if you actually read Twelve Years a Slave by Solomon Northup, he talks about the young girl Daisy, who looked like a little white girl, and how much money she would fetch in that market because they had plans that she would be one of the key child prostitutes. Uh, in one of the whorehouses in New Orleans. And so beating of children, killing children, mistreating them, that was an incredibly common thing. In fact, Mm -hmm. Wilma King wrote a book on slave children. She, uh, when she wrote it, she was a professor at Hampton 
University. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first books that really began to deal with this issue of how children were treated. Were treated, yeah. So, Deanna, when, when uh, Harriet was around 12, something happened that people would say, at least in the history books, that that was kind of the catalyst for her activism. Can you talk to us about that what is, happened to her? Yes, that is true. Um, Harriet um, was sent to a local market for some wares and, so for, and for some goods. And when she got to the market, um, it's called the Bucktown Village Store, and it is still around in Church Creek. Um, when she got to the mm -hmm. store, she noticed there was a young boy that came running in through the front door of the store, and behind him was his overseer. So the young boy was trying to flee his overseer. Well, when he got close to Harriet, the young boy, the overseer yelled at Harriet, stop him, stop him. Well, she was going to have none of that, okay? So she stepped aside to let the young boy pass to go through the door out the back. And the overseer just glanced at the countertop, and there was a, uh, a weight. And he picked up this two-pound weight to, to throw it to stop the young boy. And when he did, Harriet stepped in, and she took the blow to the head from a two-pound weight knocked her on the floor, unconscious. She was bleeding profusely from her head. And the one thing that helped a little bit with this was that she left to go to the store and her hair, she felt like her hair was a mess. So she took a shawl and she and wrapped, wrapped, around, wrapped around her head. And I'm not saying that that saved her life, but it was but a, it took some of the a cushion. little bit of the cushion. And a, mm. a portion of the scarf was driven into her skull. So she's 12, 13 years old, and she has this traumatic accident that happens to her. And I assume that the overseer and, or anyone else didn't provide any medical attention for her. No. The, what happened was the other folks who were in the store at the time, who were part of the community, who knew of her, they gathered her up and took her back to the plantation, contacted her mother. And her mother, her mother always took care of her. Mm -hmm. When she was hurt, mother was always there for her. Mm -hmm. However, it was short-lived because her overseer at the time, Brodus, um, made her get back out in the fields. Despite the this, despite what happened to her. Despite what happened wow. to her. Okay, Cassandra, let me and Joseph, I have not forgotten you. I promise you, we are coming <laughs> to you. But I want to kind of set the stage for Harriet and where she goes from here. So, Cassandra, um, she got married. Mm -hmm. um, she be, and what what when did she decide to become to run away? Number one, and then about her involvement with the underground railroad. Um, well, she got married in 1844 to a John Tubman, and that's where the Tubman name came in. Mm -hmm. um, and it was four years later that she decided to run away. Um, what was interesting is that the man she married was a free black who owned property. And Were um, they supposed to marry? Well, Enslaved and, and free blacks? Well, I mean, there were some areas that banned it but mm. a lot of areas did not. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that if a slave was involved, uh, it was not seen as legal. Mm. And, um, and, so, and that was because they didn't want any protections for enslaved people. They wanted, them, they wanted owners to be able to buy and sell them at, at will. And mm -hmm. if you were married, the spouse had rights. Um, and so um, he, she wanted to run away. Uh, and he didn't. He, he would have sacrificed his property, um, mm. his, the world that he lived in. And so she basically said, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she left with her two brothers. She who, was a strong woman. <laughs> she was a very strong woman. She left with her two brothers who got scared and turned around. I guess that was the only time anybody turned around under her watch because... She did not <clears throat> allow people to go back. If they went back, they could potentially be tortured to tell people how, who helped them escape, how they escaped, so it wouldn't endanger so many people. And that's why she carried a gun, in part. 
Mm. Um, because her position was that dead men tell no tales. <laughs> and so you were either going to be free or you're going to be dead. <laughs> and so if you embarked so if you on this, this journey. Right, you make this commitment, guess what? <laughs> right. And, and that was going to be it. And eventually she got her entire family out. A few years later, she did return trying to reconnect with her husband, but he had already remarried. And it broke her heart, but she moved on. Mm. Now, there's discrepancy in history, and Deanna, you can answer this also, um, both of you, about how many people she actually um, rescued or, or got to freedom. So start with you, Cassandra. And then go. It, you would see the numbers anywhere between 300 and 1,000. We know that she came back 19 times to, to the South. Now, by the South, I'm talking about Maryland. There are all these myths about people running away from Alabama. I mean, there's even a movie or a TV series talking about that. Okay, so cast that out of your brains <laughs> because that just did not happen. And if it happened, it was a fluke because the majority of people escaped aboard ships not by land. Land was too treacherous. By ship, you could get wherever you were going in two to three days, but by land, it could take months, and you were passing through plantations, cities, towns, etc. So it just, that mythology about the Underground Railroad, just really, when you look historically at what happened, it just doesn't add up. Even people going from Kentucky to Ohio, they cross the Ohio River, not swimming, but aboard <laughs> ships. And these were little flat boats. In fact, one of the key people who helped, he was the richest man in Ripley, Ohio. He was a free black, originally from Virginia, eventually purchased his freedom, owned a foundry there. Um, and at night, he would use his boat and take people from uh, Kentucky across the Ohio River and then help them to find freedom somewhere, usually in Canada, um, by the 1850s. But, you know, for Harriet Tubman, she was going back and forth between Maryland and Pennsylvania, specifically Philadelphia, or that area in Chester County, which is where Lincoln University was. Mm -hmm. And did she ultimately wind up going to Canada, Deanna? Yes. Yes, she did. Um, Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and to to just piggyback on what you said when you asked Cassandra this question, there are a lot of numbers out there mm -hmm. with regards to how many trips she made back, how many people she freed. And yes, you're absolutely right, Cassandra, that she didn't go down into the deep south. It was Maryland. What What we have discovered through our research is that she made her way back to Maryland 13 times. And um, within those 13 times, she was able to rescue 70 people, mostly um, family and loved ones. Now, that's regarding, that ties to the Underground Railroad. But through her efforts in helping with the Civil War mm -hmm. at the at Combahee River down mm -hmm. in Beaufort, South Carolina, she helped to free over 700. Right. Right, 700 slaves. So, again... Um, Dr. Kate Larson, who is a, um, uh, a wonderful partner of the park and who is author of the book um, Bound for the Promised Land, mm -hmm. um, we, we basically um, uh, have done a lot of communication and um, collaboration with her. And these are some of the numbers that she had been able to uh, settle on based on the research that she has done with Harriet Tubman. Um, uh, she serves the park tremendously um, as a scholar. However, again, there are numbers out there. Those are the ones that we have kind of we have settled on, and that's what we represent in the museum in Church Creek. Okay. So, so Cassandra, I know you're very involved with the Underground Railroad as it pertained to the Hampton Roads area and so forth. But but Harriet never brought people from here. No. Okay. No. But she was here to, at Fort Monroe. Right. At one point. Right. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to add sure. something um, about um, the the trips. I'm not sure that Kate Larson has actually looked at the archives at Lincoln University mm. uh, because there were there are actually a number of people who were assisted. Uh, the Hosanna Church was there, and that's where all the abolitionists gathered. Um, 
is a tiny little church, but it was a very powerful place because a lot of people who came into Philadelphia, they were disseminated into Germantown, but also into Chester County, which is where you had a lot of free blacks mm -hmm. concentrated. Um, a lot of people from Southampton County, you know, Southampton County had the largest number of people who were emancipated around the early 19th century. Uh, but then by the time of Nat Turner's revolt, they were a problem, quote unquote, for a lot of white people because they were, they were the largest uh, percentage of free blacks concentrated in any one area. Mm -hmm. And that's why the target was to attack free blacks after the Nat Turner revolt, even though they had nothing to do with it, mm -hmm. including pushing a lot of people out. And so a lot of free blacks ended up moving to... Chester County, Pennsylvania. I don't really know why they moved there. Mm -hmm. I haven't really done the research to figure out why they were moving there, but mm -hmm. a lot of them did. And that's also what create, helped to eventually create Ashman Institute, which became Lincoln University. And that whole region was key to mm -hmm. the Underground Railroad. And Harriet Tubman, there are, are uh, accounts of her coming in and out of that area. So I think that there's a lot to this history that we're <laughs> now just sort of peeling Talk back. Mm -hmm. And in part because over the years, librarians miscataloged a lot of things. And what I mean by that is they did not put front and center stories about black people in the indexing um, of, of a lot of the papers and so forth. So you have to actually dive into them yourself to find out things. And some of the records are being uncovered now because people are going back and digitizing records mm -hmm. and finding a lot of this information that they didn't know was there because of the way it was cataloged. So Harriet became um, a spy for the Union Army. She joined the Union Army, right? Am I correct in that? Okay. Well, not officially. Not officially, but yes. But she worked with them and so forth. And she was here at Fort Monroe. So before we talk about her role here, um, Joseph, I'm going to bring you into the conversation because your great, great, great grandfather um, was, was one of the contraband. Is that correct? Well, it depends on how you look at the term contraband, right? Okay. So if we go back to... What actually happens in 1861 with the outbreak of the Civil War? Um, you have uh, Frank Townsend, Shepard Mallory, and um, uh, these three black men who make their way across the river and make their way to Fort Monroe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as they are uh, becoming, as they make their way to Fort Monroe, because they are seizing their freedom in this moment uh, from their their uh, enslaver who has claimed them and who is now part of a, an opposing army who's claiming to be a part of an enemy of the United States. These three men coming to the they fortress were of the United Frank States. Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend. James Townsend, yeah. yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, as, they, as they make their way over, this action is what creates the contraband decision, which is later determined by uh, Benjamin Butler. Mm -hmm. So the contraband decision ultimately states that um, the property of those who are fighting against the United States can be seized by the uh, army of the United States for its own purposes. So this fills a gap between the start of the Civil War, uh, where it's starting out as this war to preserve the Union as it existed in 1860, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of fulfillment of that gap and the realization of the war for what it really is. It's a war to end enslavement in the United States by 1863. Mm -hmm. So James, uh, who is my ancestor, James Apostle Fields, seizes his freedom in 1861. However, he does not make it down to, uh, to Fort Monroe until 1864, mm. by which point the uh, contraband decision is no longer is no longer enacted because the Emancipation Proclamation has happened. superseded it. So now there's still people who are called contrabands. There are still people who are involved in in how that that treat and that mindset doesn't exactly change. Uh, it's kind of hard to change the army's mindset on things on a dime, right? And as they have been using uh, the contrabands as labor, in addition to um, seeing them as people in some mm -hmm. cases, using them as labor meant that they're still being used as labor even when they come 
back and after the Emancipation Proclamation, um, which also allows for black men to enlist in the mm-hmm. army. Mm-hmm. So you're, tell us about your, your family history. What, what, do you, what do you all talk about when you talk about your great-great-great-grandfather? Yeah, so we talk about not just him, but his, um, his ten siblings, um, all but one of whom make it to freedom. Uh, the youngest dies uh, in, in, while still enslaved. But then we talk about both his parents as well. Uh, Martha Ann and Washington Fields, uh, the the supporters of the family, those who are the two who are really bringing everything together. Specifically, Martha Ann, uh, who uh, you know, as my four times great grandmother, she is this um, this towering woman and this imposing figure in some ways in in the history of the family because she is so committed to her faith and to the preservation of her family that she takes such great and enormous steps in 1863 to self-emancipate not just her, but her children, her daughter's uh, fiance, and her grandchild. Uh, so leaving, leaving the, the, the farm that they had been enslaved on in Hanover County, ta- traveling all those many miles to get down to Fort Monroe. How did they travel? Do you know? <laughs> well, right. So you've got a lot of different accounts, so, or not accounts, but a lot of different uh, ways in which you get there. Overland, on the rivers, as uh, Dr. Alexander was mentioning, mm-hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, getting back here uh, on foot, you know, down here by on foot. Uh, and so George Washington Fields, James's younger brother, um, recounts that in his autobiography uh, that they left the plantation, they walked out, uh, they got to the river, saw that the, uh, the way across was, was no longer uh, viable. Uh, they have to double back ask for help uh, from a, a family member described as an uncle um, to get across the river, uh, ferrying them back and forth one by one, more or less, and then getting across the river that way so that they can get to the other side and then continue their journey down. Um, and then at a point in which they are a part of a, I'll call it a grand caravan of, of uh, people who are also seeking their own freedom, um, they're, they're on boats and there's a point at which some of the boats begin to get separated and folks think that they're heading back in the wrong direction towards slavery. And, and mm. this is a, a moment that is, is talked about in this autobiography as well mm. um, as, as, as a, a, a churning moment. Just, it's given a very brief uh, notice, but it's, it's important because there are people who are afraid in this moment, uh, knowing that if we go the wrong way, if we float the wrong way, we end up back in the, the hands of the oppressor. Uh, and so as they make their journey down, uh, ultimately arriving in Fort Monroe, um, it is an, an astounding thing that the family is reunited. And I say astounding because um, before the war, uh, you had three of Martha Ann's children separated from her, uh, two of whom had been sold in neighboring counties, one down to Richmond, one uh, to a county just down the way. But and then one who had been sold, Louisa, who had been sold all the way down to Georgia, though they did not know it, mm. uh, that that's where she had ended up. Uh, and Washington Fields did not live in the same farm as the rest of the family. Wow. And so when we're talking about, well, we were mentioning how um, it was unusual to have both mother and father in the same place. That is the case. Mm-hmm. Because even though they were able to, um, to, to marry and to have all of these children, these 11 children, uh, they were not on the same plantation. They were not on the same farm. They were not owned by the same people. Uh, and so as each of the children started to get sold away, and then James being the fourth child to leave, and, of course, he seizing his own freedom after a brutal beating, um, you see by 1864 the entire family reunited at Fort Monroe. All of them having uh, made their own separate freedom journeys and then coming Coming back back together. together. Wow. If you're just joining us, we're coming to you live from the Fort Monroe Visitor Center with a fresh look at the history of one of America's greatest freedom fighters, Harriet Tubman. My guests are internationally renowned historian and professor at Norfolk State University, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, Mr. Joseph Rogers, manager of partnerships and community engagement with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond, and Ms. Deanna Mitchell, superintendent of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad. Road National Historical Park in Church Creek, Maryland. Uh, 
audience, if you have a question, please just raise your hand so that Lisa can bring the mic over to you. Um, so in, any of you can respond to this, but what was life like as a here at Fort Monroe when Harriet would have been a nurse? What was going on here and who would she have been serving? Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Harriet Tubman became a nurse in 1865, so the word already ended, but you're talking about a devastated area. There were more battles during the Civil War that happened in Virginia than anywhere else. Why is that surprising? We're the capital of the Confederacy, so the objective was to destroy the capital. Um, and um, Magruder, uh, who led the Confederate forces here in this area, had already burned down the town of Hampton. So it's a rebuilding uh, period. And, um, and so when Harriet Tubman was asked to come and take the role of the matron, uh, which is head of the nurses, uh, and they call it the colored hospital. Um, I know that, that they often um, even now refer to it as the contraband hospital, but in the official records, they actually noted it as the colored hospital. And, um, William Seward seemed like he was her biggest fan. Um, I, I <laughs> wrote a quote from what he said in a letter when he was trying to get uh, funding for her um, at, to pensions and so forth, and, and Congress kept denying it. Eventually, she was able to get uh, a little extra money, um, even though she had served as a soldier, a spy, a nurse. <laughs> and when she was here at Fort Monroe, she did not get paid. Um, so it was like volunteer work, and and um, and medical science at that time was about as primitive as you wanted it to be, or as you, I, I don't know if most people can even imagine, but at the beginning of the war, the Surgeon General uh, ordered that all the commanders not give water to troops after a hard march, um, instead give them spirits alcohol. So let's dehydrate that's, the that's soldiers exactly. even more by giving them alcohol. That's how backward um, medical science was from the Western point of view. But Harriet Tubman, knowing all the remedies, the home remedies that her mother taught her, that were passed down gen generationally from the continent of Africa, uh, that was really light years ahead of European medicine. Um, she knew all the remedies and she applied and, and, and helped um, the, the colored hospital to really rise in terms of their medical care because you can imagine that so many black soldiers died from a lack of medical care because of the discriminatory way they were treated. Mm -hmm. And so she began to really apply a lot of the home remedies that helped a lot of those soldiers but couldn't support her family with no salary. So she eventually left and moved back to Auburn. And, you know, she had shared a home in St. Catharines, which is the Ontario province of Canada, mm -hmm. and Auburn, New York, which is also where Vivian Carter Mason, who's the third president of the National Council of Negro Women and was a resident of Norfolk who helped um, guide our integration process uh, mm -hmm. in, 18, in 1959, she actually grew up knowing Harriet Tubman wow. because they were both uh, members of the AME church and in the same AME church in Auburn. And so Harriet Tubman had these like tentacles of connections throughout the, the country. And, um, and, but, but people honored what she did. And William Seward, who was the Secretary of State under Lincoln, actually said in a letter when he was trying to get her money, said, I have known her long and a nobler, higher spirit or truer seldom dwells in human form. Mm. And so, you know, she was he was very had well this, regarded. Yes, he, he had this incredible high praise for this woman. And there's another woman he had high praise for, as well as Gideon Wells, and that was Mary Levest, who was a member of um, what we now call St. Mary's Church. Mar St. Mary's Basilica in Norfolk mm -hmm. was St. Patrick's Church uh, earlier, and she's the one who helped get the plans for the CSS Virginia, which was the USS Merrimack 
to Washington, D.C., <laughs> so that they knew that the Confederates were trying to build an iron-class ship. So yeah. here in Hampton Roads, we had some incredible people who did, all women, who did extraordinary <laughs> things. You yeah, I had to put that, that out. <laughs> Who did extraordinary, you know, I mean, there were men who did extraordinary things, but if you can imagine the role of a woman, and, and, and here on the fort, you had a few blacks who lived, many of the women who lived here were laundresses and cooks and so forth, and they got paid a little bit of money, but the majority of blacks lived in what they call Slab Town, which is now the Phoebus section, and they lived in downtown Hampton, which was called the Grand Contraband Camp, mm -hmm. um, and, as well as in surrounding areas because that's where they were protected. Deanna, was she allowed to um, also work on white soldiers? Pardon me, I'm sorry. Was she allowed to work on white soldiers also, Harriet? Well, um, that's a question I'm not sure of because um, the time that she spent here... Um, I know it, it was a short amount yeah, of time. It was, yeah, it so. was, it was, it was very, very short. But I, I, I'll be honest with you. I can't imagine that she would not have, because, um, just as Cassandra mentioned, she was held in high regard. Mm -hmm. Her, she mm -hmm. was trusted for her navigational skills. She was trusted for her healing skills, as Cassandra mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing like a grandmama's touch, right? <laughs> so her grandmother modesty was, um, was very instrumental in helping, as Cassandra mentioned, to pass down those healing properties. I, I, I could not imagine that she would not have. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the one thing that um, people need to also understand about Harriet Tubman, we're talking about, you know, her connection with um, and working with military brass and, and senators and, and secretary of states. But she could not read and write. Mm. She mm. she was not as a matter of fact she would memorize that's right. the information at, when she was a spy that's a, to yeah. and and then go back and report it exactly and um, one of the important and key aspects of the history that we tell in Church Creek Maryland is that she had a confidant and his name was Jacob Jackson Jacob and Dinah Jackson were um, free blacks who lived in um, Madison which is the community that Harriet Tubman's family lived in. Mm -hmm. And whenever she needed to get a message back home, she had someone pen her, her dictation and it would be sent to Jacob Jackson. And the, mm -hmm. and the messages that she sent him were coded. Wow. They knew, he knew exactly what he needed to do based on what <laughs> she said. She and was, it was not as you read it in verbatim. No. <laughs> She she was on point and 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 here's the thing, um, be, there was an increase. There, the slave owners were noticing an increase in the number of slaves that were, you know, fleeing, and mm -hmm. they couldn't understand how this was happening, and um, so of course the um, the police they made it their their purpose to try and get to the bottom of all of this. And they knew that Jacob Jackson was, was, you know, very, he was literate. He was a very intelligent man. He was a veterinarian. My goodness, you know, in the 1800s. And, but anyway, they started to intercept his mail. And what they would do is they would open his mail. They would read his mail. It made no sense to them, but they would confront him and says, I need you to tell me what this means. And he'd read through it. And all the time he's reading, he's like, okay, Harriet wants me to do this. Harriet, okay. I don't know. I, <laughs> you know, she's, she's just, um, she's talking about the ship of Zion. You know, she's, she, she she's loves spiritual. Yep. She's very religious. Very religious right? woman. And then he'd go and take care, <laughs> take care of what you need to take care of. So she was very ingenious for someone who, had, who could not pick up a book and read or write her name. Yeah. She was so well regarded because of what she had up here and what she had in here, her heart. Mm. Let's take a question from the audience. My name is Elizabeth. I'm actually from Hampton Roads, but I live in Los Angeles where I'm a filmmaker oh. and hoping to bring some of these stories from Hampton to the film screen. Um, I've been studying Harriet Tubman's story for years, and I know that she was very spiritual, and a lot of her explanations for some of the things that she knew and intuited came from a spiritual place. I'm very curious, for Mr. Rogers, for your family, where 11 siblings and parents were able to reunite in Fort Monroe, 
is there a family lore that explains how they all kind of knew to make that journey at the same time? That's well, a great question. Uh, that fantastic <laughs> question. Thank you so much, too. Um, while I'll say there is not necessarily a family lore that says why all the family came together, right? Why they chose specifically Fort Monroe. What we do know is that there are people, there are networks throughout uh, the area and throughout Virginia uh, that enslaved people used to communicate where they needed to go. Uh, when we think often about the 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 Underground Railroad and, and people talk about following the drinking gourd, right? Um, those same kind of communications and networks that people know to come to Freedom's Fortress. They know to come to Fort Monroe. So that became the, the one of the easiest places for people to rally. Now what I will say on the spirituality end of this is that Martha Ann knew that she was going to be reunited with her family. She mm -hmm. knew it because she prayed on it and she received, according to our own family tradition, she received that vision and that message um, that said that her family would not be torn apart any, any further. Uh, after the tragic loss of her, uh, her daughter Louisa being sold away, that sent her into such distress that she went into the forest. She went out into the woods. And there it said that after having, for, for weeks she had these, these she was in, uh, she was distraught as mm -hmm. anyone would be mm -hmm. from having lost and having had your family ripped away from you despite promises that were made uh, to the contrary. And so having these moments for weeks of her being distraught and then coming out of the, 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 the woods these, this one day with a smile on her face and mm -hmm. having heard the word that she mm -hmm. would be reunited with her family and that promise being kept all those years later um, that is part of the family tradition. That is listed in, the, in our, our family history, um, both recorded by uh, George Washington Fields and after Martha Ann's death um, in uh, the uh, Southern Workmen uh, recounting her life's uh, history as well. Wow. Joseph, let me ask you a question. As a black man in America today, with everything that's going on and, and so forth, how does this history manifest itself in your life? Mm. How do you... What, what does it do for you, um, you know, as you try to navigate through what we're dealing with now? Yes, it's, it's, it reminds me of the fact that traditions of, of African Americans, of, of black men and black uh, families is really rested on the, the work of the ancestors. Right. Mm. We, we, we look back and we can see the parallels between our family members and ourselves today. I, look, I only need to look out into this audience today to see my own Martha Ann Fields <laughs> uh, compared to my James with my mm -hmm. mother sitting out mm -hmm. here today. Um, and that you know, we both end up taking those parts of those stories, those inspiring moments, the struggle through adversity and seeing the long arc of it because James lived long enough to see the end of slavery, to become uh, the last black man to put forward a bill in the, uh, the Virginia legislature as a, a delegate mm -hmm. in the House wow. of uh, the General Assembly. So he became a part of Reconstruction? He became mm -hmm. a part of Reconstruction, mm -hmm. but then he also saw the overturning, the violent overturning of Reconstruction in the form of Jim Crow slavery and or Jim Crow segregation and oppression. And so the course of his life, he saw all of these amazing things, this future that could have been seized, and he saw a kind of crumble uh, around him in the community as well. But he never gave up. Even watching the, the 1902 Constitution take full force, he is still, until the last nine days, uh, teaching and educating black men uh, and becoming lawyers. Uh, his own, his own uh, niece, Inez Fields, would then become a lawyer herself. Uh, seeing all of these things, he never gives up on his community. He continues to be a superintendent of schools. He, he does all of this work. And so you see how the community continues to operate in, uh, through adversity and oppression, uh, knowing that we have what we need to get through it. Capital resilience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Could, could I yeah. just mm -hmm. piggyback? You know, what you were saying, talking about um, this, your ancestors seeing all of the, the mm -hmm. highs and lows. You know, today people are asking that same question uh, of many African Americans having seen President Barack Obama elected, having to see uh, Donald Trump elected, having to see these highs and lows and 
and the point of discouragement that is there, but that is a part of American history that we don't teach our children. Mm -hmm. And because we don't teach them, we don't give them the tools of resilience Absolutely. and the tools of overcoming and the tools of how do you prepare for these inevitabilities that have happened time and time and time again in American history. I'm here to tell you from 1607 <laughs> until now, we have seen these highs and lows almost on a 20-year cycle, and yet we don't teach this because we're so busy teaching a myth rather than the truth. And that's why we do another View History Lessons. Yes, a question from our audience. I'm Robin West from uh, Newport News. I had a number of questions, and I'll just pose them. Um, I have always wondered, did she wear any footwear, or was she barefoot? Um, I wanted to know also if she was taught to read and write, and that was kind of answered. And then to Mr. Rogers, he mentioned self-emancipate. Exactly how does that work, and is there a proof of that? Okay, Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's look at Di Deanna. You want to answer about the shoes uh, first? Yes. Well, um, <laughs> you know, as a little girl, as I mentioned earlier, she really... As she became, you know, a teenager, she really did prefer working outdoors. Um, but there were times in which she had some very difficult tasks that she had to do outdoors. And one of them was trapping muskrats. She had to go out in the cold waters, the cold marshes, if you will, of, of, of Dorchester County and Carolina and Talbert County. And, and trap these mus muskrats barefoot. Mm. Barefoot. And um, it was one of the tasks that she just totally <laughs> hated with, with a passion uh, because you need, you need something on your feet, you know? Um, so, but, but here again, as she became very accomplished and very comfortable with her role, um, she found ways in which not to provide footwear for herself, but others that she was helping to escape. So um, again, as a, as a little tyke, as a little one, no, not really. Um, it was rare for any slave to really have any type of proper clothing, particularly in, this, in, the, in the environment that was there in, in Maryland. Um, but eventually, yes, she was able to have a tire for her feet. Okay. Yes. Justin, let me get to yours, yeah. too, because we've got about five minutes left in this show, believe uh, it or not. And I will, <laughs> I will make sure that I can be as quick on this answer as possible. When I say self-emancipate, I mean, I mean to reclaim the actions of emancipation. Mm -hmm. um, for often, we are thinking about the terms of emancipation as someone signing away their quote-unquote rights to another human being. And in, in, inherently, I will reject that. Um, even if the legal emancipation process requires people to uh, formally do this and before the Civil War, that is to say. Um, when I say self-emancipate, I mean those millions, those hundreds of, and, and, and thousands of freedom seekers who decided that they weren't going to wait, that it wasn't enough for them to be signed away, uh, but that they themselves were possessed of inherent and dare I say it, unalienable rights, mm -hmm. uh, that they could choose to be free. And so when without I say... Without the piece of paper. Right, right, without <laughs> the piece of paper. So when I say self-emancipate, I do mean that they up and walked off, that they decided that they were going to, with their own feet, seize their emancipation, seize their freedom, and become free persons. Um, and so I, I use that language intentionally uh, and various other uh, ways in which to describe these kinds of scenarios. Uh, one that I use uh, and that I, I know that there might be a little bit of pushback, so I'll, I'll encourage on it, but uh, is when I encourage us to not think about people being born into slavery, but in fact having been enslaved at birth because mm. it is not... Uh, it was not on them who were born into it. It is an action by an oppressor, an enslaver, to do so instead of saying, well, this person was born and they should be free. Well, this person is born in their mind, so I'm going to claim them. Mm -hmm. And so one is enslaved at birth uh, rather than uh, being born, born into, into slavery. Okay. Glenn Oder is the executive director of the uh, Fort Monroe Authority. And Glenn, I just wanted to give you a few minutes that we have left to talk a little bit about what people will experience as you've heard this conversation 
here at Fort Monroe. Well, thank you, Barbara, and to all the people that, that came here to speak. This is wonderful. We, uh, we love to, for people to come to visit the new visitor center at Fort Monroe and be part of this. It's a beautiful new building uh, built by the Commonwealth of Virginia and operated by the Fort Monroe Authority. And we work closely with the National Park Service here at Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe is a property which has been cocooned, in my opinion, for about 200 years. And the Army did it. It wasn't the Army's job to tell these stories. The Army had a different mission. But our new mission is to tell these stories and to tell stories that have, we've never wanted to talk about before. And quite frankly, we've never really been very transparent about them, much as Dr. Kasudran Alexander said. It's time for us to do that. And that's what we do here at Fort Monroe. And I would close by saying this. If you come to Fort Monroe, you get to walk in the spaces of the people that we talked about today. You get to sit underneath historic trees that they would have seen when they would have been here. You get to see the walls that they built that became Freedom's Fortress. You get to hear the waves on the shore that those first 20 and odd would have heard when they came here. And you, you get to experience all that and sit and imagine and join us as we try to make those sounds and those spaces and those voices come to life here at Fort Monroe. And thank you so much for hosting us today. I appreciate it. Okay, panelists, we've got about a minute and a half left. One final thought about history and why this is important. Deanna, let's start with you. Why this is important. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a woman who came from very, very meager, meager beginnings and became a giant. She was only five feet tall but she was a giant in all of her actions. And she took, um, she took her, what she was doing to try to seek freedom very seriously. She developed trades that really made her the woman that she was um, in, in, into her late 90s when she passed. So I, I, just, I just honestly do believe that um, we could not be um, uh, commemorating and honoring a, a more special person in our history. That's Deanna Mitchell, superintendent of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park in Church Creek, Maryland. Joseph? Um, I will say that I kind of want to piggyback again on the, the cyclical nature of history. There are many faith traditions that recognize the cyclical nature of both history and of justice. And so when I think about these times that James was in, seeing the, ri the end of slavery, the rise of, of uh, um, uh, Reconstruction, and then Jim Crow, I think about the times that we are in today, and I think about how that history continues to operate in cycles, but how the cycle of justice continues to get longer and longer and and longer until we hope that the cycle of injustice will be even shorter, shorter than, than ever. <laughs> that is Joseph Rogers, manager of partnerships and community engagement with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. Last 20 seconds, Cassandra. <laughs> History should never be politicized. History is truth. History does set you free. History takes no prisoners. History is not about whether or not you feel comfortable with it. It is what it is. And that is our favorite historian, <laughs> Dr. Cassandra Levy Alexander. <laughs> you know, audience, we cannot know where we're going until we understand our past. And that's why we bring you these Another View history lessons. Please share this show with a friend. Go to anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. And while you're there, please sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. Next week on Another View, guess what? More history. We're talking about the history of Cuffee Town, a community developed by free blacks in the 1700s in Chesapeake. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn, Victor Bowen, and Christy Jordan are the folks who made us sound good. They're the audio engineers. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thanks for listening, everyone, and let's get together again next Thursday at noon for Another View. <laughs>
Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice, whether starting your bachelor's degree or advancing your career. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.